Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Forest River R-Pod 202. Uh, we're going to start right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, right at the very front we have your tongue and your coupler latch. So, uh, of course the starting position is going to be unlocking that coupler. Uh, it does have a hold back for that uh, ease of use when it does come to loading and unloading. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and slide that back. From there we are going to raise this jack three inches above our ball and drop. We are going to center ourselves underneath the coupler. Of course, then we're going to uh, seat that coupler on top of that ball uh, using the electric tongue jack. Once fully seated, we can go ahead and slide this forward, locking that down. Uh, paying special attention that our two teeth here on either side are fully engaged in the frame uh, and we are fully secure there. Uh, not a bad idea to go ahead and add a secondary pin that is also going to uh, aid in the security factor of everything. Uh, from there, we're going to go ahead and take your tow chains. We're going to make sure that those are crossed underneath the coupler and we're going to hook those onto the receiver of the vehicle. Uh, it is state law in Texas that they do need to be crossed as well as it is illegal for them to make contact with the pavement at any time. So uh, make sure you skate that fine line of having enough room to make your turns left or right but not so much room that these may make contact with the pavement. Riding right next to those is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. Uh, this is your last line of defense. Uh, if these two uh, tow components were to fail, the coupler and the tow chains, as the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system. Uh, pulling this uh, is going to effectively lock up those brakes, uh, avoiding a kind of runaway trailer scenario. So, uh, name of the game with this is going to be three com connection points on the receiver. So, uh, of course, two for the tow chains, one for the emergency breakaway, whether you use a carabine or quick link, uh, whatever you have, as long as this has its own connection point to the receiver. Uh, again, uh, going to making sure that you have enough room to make your turns properly, but not so much room that it uh, makes contact with the pavement. Uh, also, riding right next to all of that is going to be your seven-way uh, plug here. Uh, now, this plugs directly into the bumper receptacle. This is going to give you full function to your uh, vehicle's charging system, your vehicle's braking system, tail lights, marker lights, things like that. So we're going to make sure that this is fully uh, plugged into the bumper receptacle, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, hopping up here to the electric tongue jack here. Uh, first switch we come to is going to be the light. That's going to give you a point of reference if you are backing up to the unit at dark. Uh, it's going to make it easy to uh, hook up things down here again after dark. Uh, below that we have a up or down switch. We're going to push that switch in the direction uh, that we wish the jack to move. Uh, and we're gonna, that's going to make it very easy to load and unload uh, the camper here. Now, if we go ahead and remove this plug here on the back of that jack head, uh, that is going to expose the manual drive. Uh, we're going to use this crank handle here. We're going to seat that properly. That will allow us to go ahead and move that jack up or down. Uh, in the event of a power loss situation, uh, we can at the very least load that camper or unload it uh, to go ahead and take it and get it serviced. Uh, directly behind that, we have your 20 pound propane cylinder. It's the same variant you're going to find on any gas grill, very common, uh, open and close valve on the top, very easy to exchange or uh, refill on the road. It is held in place here with a tension band. Uh, we're going to loosen or tighten that uh, wing nut to secure the tank or remove the tank for service. Uh, of course, disconnect your propane hose here, uh, easy screw on pigtail. This is all covered with the propane compartment or propane cover here. Uh, we're going to line this up here with this hole uh, and stud and we're going to go ahead and put that wing nut on uh, making sure everything is in line. Uh, of course may take you a couple minutes to get that lined up but uh, once you see that stud coming through you can go ahead and put this wing nut on that is going to secure that. That's going to not only protect that tank from uh, you know, weather, uh, keep the weather off the tank, but also will protect it from any road debris, anything like that. Uh, back behind there, as you see here, we have two Group 24 deep cycle batteries on this particular unit. That was a customer upgrade, so uh, I wouldn't expect that to be the norm, of course, but we would be happy to accommodate you if that is something you are wanting to add. 
what we have is again deep cycle interstate batteries. Now these are lead acid batteries, which means they do carry some maintenance. Two or three times a year, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels up. We're gonna re refill with distilled water as necessary. Uh, other than that, uh, we are going to utilize this battery disconnect switch that we have down here. Uh, what that does is that isolates those batteries from the 12 volt system. With any 12 volt system, you're gonna run into nominal or phantom draws there in the background. This is designed for periods of long-term storage. Again, to go ahead and help isolate those batteries, uh, keep them in tip-top shape while you are storing the unit. Uh, moving on here to the side, we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. Now these are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. What that means for you uh, is once we have attained our level, and if we are doing any leveling front to back, we're gonna use the main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right, we're gonna use the tires in uh, a leveling kit. So once we are within three degrees of level, we're then gonna go ahead and run these stabilizer jacks down. We're gonna again use that included crank handle. We're going to put that over that three quarter inch drive nut and we're gonna go ahead and crank them down. So uh, these are not load bearing jacks. They are just meant to stabilize the floor. So we're gonna come down, we're gonna make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Same on the way up. No need to go overly snug in either position. Uh, here in your, your large pass-through compartment here, uh, if we go ahead and, and remove this screw, uh, we can go ahead and uh, pull this panel out, and it looks like I got it wedged in here a little bit. If we go ahead and remove that panel, we're going to expose your water pump here. Uh, this is, of course, that's for just good general maintenance uh, or servicing. But also, you do have a vacuum inlet here. Now you're gonna utilize that for winterization. Uh, adding antifreeze to the system is gonna be done from this line here. So uh, just to kind of give you a little uh, preview of what that is going to entail. Of course, all the water would be purged from the unit. Uh, we're going to then uh, open up this vacuum line by moving that valve into that secondary position. We would then stick this into a bottle of RV grade antifreeze we flip on that water pump switch and then we walk from fixture to fixture turning both the hot and the cold side excuse me of each fixture on and once we've done so we see that that antifreeze solution at the fixture uh, that is a good indicator that we are fully winterized give it a few seconds running down the drain to make sure you're filling up any p traps anything like that uh, once we are done we want to make sure that we do uh, return that water pump to service uh, by uh, putting that valve in the original position. Uh, moving on, we have your potable water fill here. Uh, if you're doing any boondocking or off-grid camping, you're gonna fill this up before you get there. Uh, we're gonna stick your drinking water hose directly in that hole. Uh, we're gonna fill it up till we're satisfied. Uh, once full, we cap it off. Uh, just, just to let you know, this is non-pressurized water, so it is very important that we do use the onboard water pump. Uh, that is switched on the inside. We're, of course, going to get eyes on that switch when we do uh, get to the inside, but that's going to pull that water up from the tank to the fixtures and make that usable. Uh, now, city water connection is directly be below that. Uh, that's what we're going to utilize if we're staying in the capacity of an RV park. If we have access to full-time running water, we're going to go ahead and use that city water connection. Uh, now, water pressure becomes very important uh, when we do use this city water connection. Uh, what we're looking for is a working water pressure in between 40 and 75 PSI. So it's very important that we do not exceed that 75 PSI uh, pressure limit. Uh, to help with that, we're gonna use a water pressure regulator. Uh, this is going to hook all, directly onto the water source and then our hose onto that. Uh, that's going to reduce that pressure to a working uh, rating for this camper. Uh, with, that, with that water pressure regulator on the spigot side, we're going to make our connection here on the camper by rotating that camper connection, very easy. Uh, Definitely want to run with a water pressure regulator at all times when you are on that city water connection. So uh, easily available, any RV part, any Walmart is going to carry a water pressure regulator. If this were to get lost or damaged, uh, please make sure you replace it before taking the unit out. Uh, if we get low here for a minute, we have your freshwater drain. Uh, that is uh, uh, terminating on the bottom of the camper. That is how we drain that potable water tank. So. Uh, in the event that it's been in use, uh, make sure you drain it when you're done. Manufacturer recommends that water is not stagnant within the unit for more than seven days. So if you're bringing it back into storage and this potable water tank has been in use, let's make sure we do drain it before storing it. 
Uh, moving on, we have um, some dump valves here. Um, you have gray for gray water, which is uh, of course going to be sink water, shower water, relatively clean water. Uh, black for black water, which is going to be toilet waste, body waste, things like that, anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, now these valves will remain in the closed position and we're only going to dump as necessary. It's very important that we keep the uh, contents of these tanks in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, specifically with that black water tank, you got that toilet paper, that solid body waste. Uh, we want all of that to evacuate that tank uh, easily and completely. So it is very important that we do keep these valves in the closed position until it is time to dump. And you're going to dump whether uh, you're going to dump either when the tank indicates to be full or you're changing location. So whichever comes first. So uh, also when we talk about these valves, uh, they should never be open at the same time. Uh, you want to avoid any cross contamination or back feeding issues. So make sure that you uh, are only having one open at, at a time. And to open those valves, it is just going to be a six inch pull uh, in this case towards me. And in this case towards the front of the camper. Uh, where the wastewater actually comes out is going to be this bayonet style fitting here. Uh, your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way your cap does, uh, which you will have a keyhole on the cap and on the sewage hose. You'll have four prongs here along the outside. Uh, as long as you put this cap in that halfway position, you give it a quarter turn, that's going to secure it on. So again, just to recap, even when you are hooked up to full-time septic with a hose, these valves do need to be kept in the closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we are only going to dump as necessary. So very important. We have your black tank flush here. Uh, that's going to work in conjunction with your uh, sewer outlet connections down here. This corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make this connection here with any old uh, garden hose. Of course, you're going to want to have its own uh, hose set up for this. So once we've made that connection here, we're going to allow that water to rush in the tank. Uh, generally, we would be keeping that valve in the closed position. Once we have water rushing into that tank, we're going to go ahead and run into the inside and we're going to expect the level of full of that tank. Uh, absolutely, we do not want to overflow that tank. Uh, be, reason being is because uh, there is no check valve or anything to keep that water actually in the tank. The path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vent. So if you let water rush into that black water tank uh, for too long, it's going to uh, come out of the roof line. So keep that in mind. So uh, with water flushing in here, we're going to run inside. We're going to inspect the level. Uh, once it gets to be about two thirds full, we're going to go ahead and run back out here and we're going to relieve that pressure here on the valve. Uh, what we're doing is we're rinsing any compounding of toilet waste and body waste from the tank. It's a very important thing to do. You're going to want to do this every single time uh, you're taking the unit out or, uh, you know, returning it back to service. Uh, at some point, you're going to want to flush that that black water tank and be careful when you do because you definitely do not want to overflow it. So make sure it's something that you're staying diligent about uh, and uh, doing it properly. Uh, that way we don't have any uh, accidents. Uh, with the unit overall, we're going to get on a 90 day maintenance schedule. Uh, what that's going to fully entail is doing a 360 degree inspection of all the sealants on the unit every 90 days. Also at those intervals, we are going to lubricate these slide rails and we're also going to treat these seals. So uh, what we're going to use to lubricate these tracks and you have these tracks top to bottom, left to right of the slide. What we're going to use to lubricate those is going to be a dry silicone lubricant. Uh, comes in an aerosol can. We're going to spray that down. We're going to run that slide in and out a few times to distribute that lubricant and we're going to be good for the next 90 days. Uh, here on the seals we're going to use an rv uh, rv grade seal conditioner and you have these seals running all the way around that slide out so make sure we are treating them uh, all the way around oh you're going to spray that product you're going to let it sit uh, wipe off any excess now keep in mind the slide does seal in both directions which means it seals in the out position seals in the in position you do have a set of these seals on the inside and it is very important that we do treat both seals we want to keep that rubber nice and supple uh, so that's the slide out maintenance uh, portion of that 90 day uh, maintenance schedule. Now the structural maintenance, uh, anywhere where two pieces come together on the body, they are going to uh, utilize a 
uh, a certain kind of sealant. Uh, here on, on the wall surfaces, they're going to use a 100% silicone product. I think in most cases here on this particular camper, it's just going to be a clear silicone. On the roof, they use a uh, self-leveling lap sealant, which you're going to have to source out from an RV dealer. So uh, what we're looking for is any degradation in those seals, any separation, any cracking, anything like that. We're going to make sure we touch up as necessary. So again, keep in mind, every 90 days, it is very important that we do these things to keep everything in good working order. Uh, tire pressure and lug nuts, those are another very important thing to talk about. Uh, lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in this shop. Uh, manufacturer has a, a retorque procedure. Uh, Forest River's retorque procedure is the first 50, 100 miles, and 200 miles. Uh, the initial, those initial intervals, uh, the manufacturer wants you to stop and retorque those lug nuts down to 100 foot-pounds. Make sure they are, again, maintaining that 100 foot-pounds. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the uh, start of each trip, there on after, you just go ahead and check them, make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, tire pressure is going to be found on the sidewall of the tire in the traditional location. Uh, easier than that, you have a data tag here for the tires, and in this case, it's going to be 65 psi. So that's the max tire pressure rating. Uh, on the tire and for any trailer tires, that's exactly where you want to run them is at that max tire pressure rating. That's going to give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Whether we're completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is going to be a good number. Now when it comes to changing a tire, uh, we are going to want to place our jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. Um, Make sure that, of course, this unit in particular does not carry a lug wrench, does not carry a jack. So make sure you have that stuff with you in the event of emergency and that uh, the jack inside your tow vehicle is going to accommodate the height of lifting this up to go ahead and, and change, uh, change tire. Uh, moving right along. Uh, down low here underneath the slide, we have a secondary gray water tank uh, or dump, I should say. Uh, nothing that, that changes that from what we've already saw. Uh, just po simply pointing out the location. It's going to operate the very same. This is going to be uh, your kitchen, you know, kitchen sink, things like that are going to carry its own separate gray water tank because of the floor plan of the unit. Uh, cable satellite inlet here. So that's a standard RG6 cable fitting. Uh, just a pass-through connection to introduce a cable or satellite uh, service to the unit. Uh, some higher-end campgrounds, aftermarket satellite, or uh, you know, satellite companies will offer an aftermarket satellite package geared towards RVers. Uh, either way, this is where those uh, enter the unit. They're going to terminate at the designated TV areas of the camper. Uh, 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. This is your cord, comes with the unit, generally 25 to 30 feet in length, uh, is only going to plug into the camper one way. So if we go ahead and take a look there at the plug, we have two slants and one L. As long as we line those up properly, it's going to plug straight in. We give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in. Then we do have this secondary collar here to screw down, lock it in further. Uh, it's my number one recommendation with any unit that I deliver uh, that you go ahead and add a 30 amp surge protector uh, to this setup. That's the only thing you can do to protect you from substandard wiring, dirty power, surges, anything like that. Uh, that surge protector is going to plug directly into the power source uh, and then your cord into that, of course, and then making this connection here. Again, very, very important for you to, to something to think about. Uh, adding and it is really the only thing you can do to protect your unit electronically. Now, uh, if you have any questions on which products we recommend, how to use them, anything like that, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and educate you uh, again on what we recommend and how to use it. Uh, moving on here to the backside of the unit, a uh, couple things going on. We of course have uh, rooftop ladder access. Uh, that's going to aid you while you are doing that inspection of those rooftop seals. Uh, at the very least, you're going to be crawling up that ladder uh, uh, once every 90 days. Uh, above that, we have a hood vent here. Now that, of course, corresponds with the overhead vent above the stove. Uh, 
Uh, it is very important that we do open that before cooking a meal. This one's very easy. It just has uh, some tabs uh, and it's held in by friction. So you just go ahead and lift it open. Uh, then you can go ahead and, and cook a meal and it's going to exhaust properly. And then before going down the road, we want to make sure we keep any road debris or weather uh, from entering in that location and you're just going to close it. Uh, down below here, we have uh, your furnace vent. Uh, that is going to be your an exhaust vent. Uh, now, with any propane burning appliances within this unit, it's going to be our recommendation that you do protect it uh, from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects, things like that. They are attracted to the smell of propane, so they will more than likely crawl right up that exhaust pipe, uh, just clo get as close as they can to the flow of propane and build their dirt nest. So, uh, only way to effectively protect yourself is going to be screening uh, the outside of, of, again, not only the furnace here, but the water here, the refrigerator, things like that. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, what else we got? So we got a tube storage bumper, easier to see from this side. Uh, Going to have a cap on each side. If you go ahead and remove that cap, you can go ahead and put your uh, sewage hose in there. Uh, you can go ahead and store any long items uh, you would be inclined to do so. Uh, we have your full-size spare tire here. Uh, it's just going to be a generic steel wheel, uh, but it is nice to have that, uh, that, that hooked onto the bumper here in the event that you do, uh, again, need it. Um, up top there, you can see a backup camera. Again, that was a customer add-on for this particular unit, but all of these 202s do come pre-wired for a backup camera. Uh, makes the installation very, very easy. Uh, and again, uh, that is an excellent upgrade. Uh, and we'd be happy to do that for you uh, if you'd like. Uh, and then we have your refrigerator vent here. Again, other than being an intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects, again, I'm going to stress the importance of uh, protecting uh, that from happening. We are going to give this a visual inspection a couple times a year. To do so, we're going to uh, rotate these locking tabs into that secondary position. We're then going to remove this. Once we've done so, we're going to take a look here inside the compartment, making sure we don't see any frayed, frayed wires, we don't see any, uh, you know, leaking lines, anything like that. We're going to give it a visual inspection. Uh, if it looks good, then generally we're good to go, uh, and it's going to stay in good shape. So this refrigerator does need to be within three degrees of level for that to operate properly. So when leveling the unit, uh, ultimately this is what we're concerned about. So make sure we are paying special attention to that. Uh, when replacing this vent cover, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put the tabs down. We're going to swing it up, make sure our tabs uh, seat properly. And once we've done so, we're going to give them a quarter turn again, locking them on, going back, making sure everything is secure. Uh, now down low again. We have low point drains. Those are going to be these two valves here right on the other side of that stabilizer jack. Now those are the lowest points in the unit's plumbing. That's how we're going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. So as I mentioned previously, uh, manufacturer recommends that if the unit is going to be in, store, in storage for more than seven days, uh, that we do so without any water. So of course, drain the Drain the, uh, the freshwater tank if it's been in use. Drain these low point drains uh, every single time. Uh, that is again going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. So uh, the last kind of the last stop on that draining procedure is going to be draining the uh, water heater separate of the system. It's very important that we do so uh, to keep that nice and fresh. So uh, manufacturer has a few uh, recommendations on how to do so. Uh, and they're going to keep you nice and safe. So it is very important that we do follow this kind of to a T, uh, again, from a safety standpoint. So uh, number one, when it does come to depressurizing and draining the water heater, we're going to give it ample time to cool down, generally a lot longer than you would think, at least two or three hours. So, excuse me. So once we, we're fairly certain of the temperature of the unit, it's very important that we do depressurize the unit. So uh, first step in depressurizing the, depressurizing the unit is we are going to make sure that we do not have any new water flowing into the unit overall. So we're going to cut off uh, any of those water connections. If we're using the, if we're using the potable water and the uh, 
the water pump, it's very important that we, we flip that switch in that off position. Uh, we want no water uh, pressurized throughout the unit. So once we've done so, uh, we are then going to depressurize the water heater itself. Easiest way to do that is going to be using the hot side of any fixture within the unit. So uh, open the door, go straight to the kitchen sink, turn that hot side of the fixture on. You'll see a little bit of water and pressure come from uh, the spigot there. Uh, once you've done so, or once you stop seeing water at that location, that is your indicator that uh, the unit is depressurized and we can go ahead and continue to drain it. So. Uh, to drain it, we're going to use an inch and a sixteenth socket extension and ratchet. And once we've safely depressurized the unit, we're going to remove your drain plug here with that uh, socket. So uh, back that out. Uh, you're going to see, you know, five and a half to six gallons of water uh, evacuate the tank from this location. And that's it. The unit is safely drained. It's ready for storage. You're good to go. Uh, now. To return the unit back to service uh, and get it ready for the next use, uh, of course, you do need to uh, replace that drain plug there. Uh, once you've done so, um, we're going to introduce a, an inflow of water to the unit or pressurize the system. So if that's going to be uh, you know, city water connection, we're going to make that connection. We're going to physically turn on that valve, and then we have water coming into the unit. If that's going to be the potable water, we're going to flip on that 12-volt uh, water pump and we're going to pressurize the system. So once we've pressurized the system, we're going to again go to any uh, fixture within the unit. And in this, in this example, we're going to use the kitchen sink again. We're going to go to that hot side of the kitchen sink. We're going to turn that spigot on. Once we've done so, we're going to see a slightly different scenario. Uh, you're going to see water at that location, a lot more water, but that flow is going to be very spitty, very interrupted. It may make a mess on the countertop. What it's doing is it's displacing the air within the tank here and refilling it with water. Uh, it takes you know, less than five minutes to do so, but once that flow normalizes at that fixture, that is our indicator that we do have six gallons of water in the unit. We have effectively primed it. We are ready to start heating that water uh, for our liking. Uh, so it is very important that we do um, operate the unit in, the, in that uh, fashion. Uh, not only from a safety standpoint, but it is going to keep the unit itself in good working condition for the long haul. Now, I referenced this as a drain plug, and it is in fact a drain plug, but it does also pull double duty. It is uh, anode rod as well. So uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that water heater and effectively eat away at that as opposed to the inside uh, of the water heater. So uh, on the other side of this actual drain plug, you're going to see a three quarter inch by 12 inch magnesium rod. Um, what I'm getting at ultimately is that is a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes. Uh, again, starts out about three quarters of an inch in diameter. By the time it needs to be replaced, it's gonna be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit. So keep that in mind uh, as we are operating the unit. Now this is a dual source water heater. Uh, we'll run on a 110 volt uh, straight electricity uh, or we'll also run on propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, to turn that on uh, or the electric element on, of course you gotta remove that piece of tape first. Uh, don't worry, I got it. So we see a toggle switch here, uh, clearly marked on and off. Uh, we just need to turn that on. That's the electric heating element. Now, the biggest thing I find that people uh, forget is to turn this off when they do start to drain it and things like that. Making sure uh, when you're done using the unit for the weekend or whatever, that we go ahead and turn this off before uh, going through that draining procedure and storing the unit. So very important. Uh, our propane controls are going to be on the inside. We're gonna get a look on those switches. Uh, other than that, uh, for this appliance, it is very important, again, uh, that we do uh, protect it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. You get some louvers here, some grating. Uh, you know, easy for bugs to make their way past that. So we're going to need to go one step further and, again, protect that from mud daubers and flying insects. Once you've shut the door like I did so, you're going to take the latch, pull it towards you, uh, rotate it, and uh, there you go. That door is locked and closed. Uh, nice heavy duty fold out steps with this particular unit. Uh, very easy to get those, uh, to store those and use those. So 
Uh, before I do any of that, I want to point out that you have feet on here, and this is the lowest position. This is the camper relatively level, and that's going to be on that lower position. Now, dependent on your camping scenario uh, and changes in the ground grade, you may be articulating these feet uh, to, to attain that level. It is very important that for the most part, this is very stable surface. Uh, so do your best uh, with the adjustments there to, to make that happen. Uh, also, this door needs to be all the way open for that to fold up correctly. Once you've done so, you just go ahead and lift these up. You have a very easy uh, latch there, and that's just going to hold it up. And then when, of course, you are ready to use those steps or enter the unit, pull that blue handle, allow them to fold down. Adjust the feet as necessary. Very easy. Uh, we also have a standard RV handrail. Uh, this locks in that outward position going down the road. We're going to store that against the body there, so very easy to do. Um, Awning, speakers, porch light, those are all going to be switched on on the inside. We're going to definitely get to that location there on the, the location of those switches on the inside. We'll talk about them uh, at that time. Uh, what we have here is going to be um, an outside kitchen area, of course. Uh, you have a water sprayer here uh, to, to be used in conjunction with this sink. Uh, what you're going to do is you have a quick connect collar here. So we go ahead and we slide that locking collar back. Uh, that will allow us to either connect or uh, disconnect this hose. Uh, slide that locking collar back, insert the mail in fully. Once fully inserted, that's going to snap back and lock in. Uh, it automatically pressurizes the hose. Uh, if you're having trouble overcoming that locking mechanism here or that quick connect here, uh, go ahead and cut pressure to the unit and, and open this valve up, let that pressure bleed from the hose. That's going to make that connecting and disconnecting uh, procedure a lot easier here at the, the quick connect. Um, other than that, we have your sink here. Uh, this is you need to remove this to, to pack everything up. Uh, so I'm going to preemptively do that. So with that out of the way, um, and I guess before I remove the grill, I should kind of kind of talk to you about that. Um, this griddle is awesome. It works really well. It, it has a igniter there to make light, lighting it nice and easy. Um, it is a, also going to utilize a quick connect fitting. So. Uh, we have a quick connect hose here on the back side of that. Uh, that angle might be a little uh, slightly tough to get, uh, but again, that's going to utilize that locking collar. We're going to slide that collar back, uh, insert the mail in fully. Once we've done so, we have a valve here. We do just need to put that in the inline position, and that's going to allow propane to flow to the appliance. We again have a very similar connection here on the body or the frame rail. Uh, again, you're going to need to make sure that that valve is on too. So two valves, two connections to make that happen. Once we've done that, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to light the grill. So we're going to momentarily uh, take, these cook, take this cooktop off so we can actually inspect it. And then we hold this in like we're, we're lighting a pilot and we just rotate it to the left. We can see that, that piezo igniter there sparking. And we're just going to continue to do that until we see that flame. Once we've done that, we can, of course, rotate the intensity of our uh, flame uh, for dependent on, on whatever we're cooking. Uh, when it comes to kind of folding everything back up and getting rid of it, of course, I already put the sink uh, in, the, in the storage compartment uh, over there. I'm going to do the same here with the griddle. So uh, when I'm disconnecting this, again, just like I, I referenced earlier, I slide that locking collar back. I remove that male end. I do the very same thing here. Once I've done that, I go ahead and I take my hose and my griddle, and we're going to store that here in this front compartment. So with that out of the way, I can go ahead and fold this slide out tray out, or put it back away. So with that folded up, that goes in like that, very easy. Uh, now, of course, you have a refrigerator in here as well. Uh, nice, nice, uh, nice dorm style refrigerator. Um, 
you're going to have to take uh, my word on the adjustment. So you have an adjustment dial, but it is very, very far on the backside of the unit. And this is bolted down. So you gotta have long arms. You gotta reach all the way back uh, towards the bottom corner. You're going to see a, a, a knob and it's going to take some, some fine tuning to, to figure out the temperature you like. Once you've done so, I suggest that you just leave it there um, to keep you from having to, to access that kind of in that awkward position. So something to think about there. Um, of course, this is all closed up there. Um, you know, nothing too crazy there. Uh, a couple all weather 110 volt outlets here. Uh, make it easy for you to add any uh, appliances here on the outside. If you're enjoying the porch space that you have here, you want to plug in a boom box, whatever, uh, charge the phones, you can easily do so uh, on that 110 volt connection there. Um, just about covering it here on the exterior of the unit. Of course, this is our other side of our pass through compartment. Uh, really, you know, everything that we've already seen, kind of uh, the usual suspects as I call them. Uh, so that just about takes care of it here on the exterior of the unit. Let's go hop on the inside and take a look at those features. Right here inside the uh, entry door, we have our first piece of safety equipment. That's going to be your fire extinguisher. Uh, it is very important that we do test all of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. So in this case, testing this fire extinguisher, uh, we push that green tab down. If it springs back like so, that means we have pressure inside the unit. It's good to go, safe to use, all that stuff. If that green tab stays depressed, that means it is time to replace. So we're gonna go ahead and source a fire extinguisher uh, and replace it. Uh, hopping around here uh, to the refrigerator, uh, we're gonna go ahead and open that to expose the controls there. Uh, very easy, very basic kind of in the controls. We of course have your on off switch. When we turn it on, that's going to kick us right into that auto mode on that auto side of things. It's going to default to AC voltage first. If it does not find AC voltage, it's going to automatically uh, start lighting on gas. Uh, now, if we want to run it on gas without that auto switch over, we just need to de depress that gas button uh, and reading the position of the switch, that tells us that we are in that gas mode. There are not going to be any light indicators to tell us that. Uh, if it fails to light on that gas uh, side of things, it's going to illuminate this check light and give an audible tone as well. So uh, very easy to use. Very basic, very user friendly. Uh, you get a ton of space, uh, works out very well. Uh, moving on here into the kitchen. Uh, first up is going to be a light switch. That's for that under cabinet lighting, a very nice feature. We of course have a couple 110 volt outlets uh, lighting there uh, underneath the cabinet as well. Uh, our hood and fan, our hood light and fan here, uh, our cooktop here. Uh, now this is a very kind of basic Coleman camping style uh, cooktop. This one is of course made by Suburban. Uh, it's going to function just like any other camping stove. Uh, no spark or igniter on this particular model. So we are going to need to uh, have a long stem barbecue lighter with the unit. We're going to turn that to light. Once we've done so, we're going to go ahead and put our flame directly here on the burner until we see fire at the burner. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and adjust that uh, low to high uh, dependent on what we are preparing. Uh, and then down below that, we have your um, three-way microwave oven, uh, high point three-way microwave oven. Uh, very, one of my favorite appliances uh, within these units. Uh, this uh, not only functions as a microwave, it functions as a convection oven, uh, as well as a grill. So you have a cooking element on top of there, kind of acts like a, um, you know, toaster oven or whatever. Uh, Controls are very microwave-esque in design. Uh, you'll choose a temperature here on the dial, uh, your, your mode here up top. Uh, very easy to navigate around. Of course, it's going to carry its own service manual. Uh, consult that if needed. Uh, moving on here uh, into the, uh, the couch area. Now, this is a jackknife sofa. Uh, you got a couple, a lot of different options when it comes to this. Uh, starting with the, the jackknife portion of that, of course, you have that pull handle here. If we go ahead and pull that up, that allows that to rotate and lay down for a secondary sleeping area. Very cool. Um, of course, we're going to return that back up to its couch position. Uh, once we've done so, we also have some recliner action there. So we can go ahead and open both of these up. Um, 
you know, for recliners works really well for that. Uh, and also you have uh, some spots here for some tables. Um, let me see if I can find these tables. Yep, here they are. So these are cool too. So um, of course, not really a dinette in this particular floor plan. So uh, once you've prepared a meal here in the kitchen, you can go ahead and put these there into the couch, set your plate there. Uh, at least you have a surface to eat off of. And again, very easy to do so. You just go ahead and, and put those in. So it doesn't get easier than that. Uh, hopping over here to this location, uh, a ton, 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 ton going on on this wall. So uh, starting with the TV, uh, you know, nothing too crazy with that. Uh, this is a uh, 12 volt TV. So you're going to have access to that off grid. Uh, is locked into this position. So it is not uh, positionable uh, further than this. So you really, your only option is watching it from this location. Um, other than that, very straightforward stuff. Uh, it's going to operate just like any other TV. Uh, it does have, of course, a remote, things like that, uh, as you would expect. Uh, coming down low, uh, we have a GFI protected outlet here. Uh, allows, you, allows you to power any 110 volt appliances. We also on the other side have uh, a couple USBs will allow you to charge your phone, uh, whatever. These are 12 volt USBs, 110 volt uh, GFI protected outlet. Uh, we have your convenience center here, courtesy panel, micro monitor, goes by many different uh, names. They all generally function the very same way. Uh, this is going to give you a real time readout of where your tanks sit uh, in level of full. So of course we can see the corresponding scale here. Uh, but more or less, the more light you see, the fuller that uh, tank or whatever we're testing is. So uh, gray water is empty, gray water two is empty, gray water one is empty, black water is empty, fresh water is full, and battery is full. Now, battery in particular when we're testing here is going to read full uh, anytime we're plugged into shore power like we are now. So to get a honest readout of where you sit in level of full, uh, we need to unplug from shore power and then go ahead and, and test here from this location. Uh, now below that, we got two red switches. They are clearly marked. Uh, one is going to be your water pump switch. Uh, again, just to recap, that's to draw that water up from that potable water tank to the fixtures and make it usable. So any uh, time we, are, uh, we do not have access to full-time running water, we're gonna go, you, go ahead and use that water pump to pressurize that system. Uh, and then we have your water heater switch beside that. Now, as we, again, to kind of recap, this is going to be the propane only side of your water heater. Uh, the 110 volt heating element is going to be on the outside on the water heater itself. Uh, now we turn this water heater switch on and this fault light's gonna come on with that switch. Now you see that fault light just went out. Uh, as that water heater goes through its lighting cycle, you're gonna see that light come on and off at, at least three times. Uh, the water heater tries to light uh, three times. If it does not light by the end of that third time, it's going to stop trying and it's going to kind of enter a standby mode. Uh, reason why it would not light the first time every single time or is because is uh, you may have a couple different scenarios going. Uh, either the valve on top of that propane tank is closed, either that propane cylinder doesn't have any gas in it, uh, or uh, since the propane is really far up front and the water heater is all the way at the rear, the propane may just not have traveled through the line in time uh, by, that, by the time that that water heater has timed out. So uh, in the event that that happens, of course, go outside, make sure your valve's open, make sure you have propane in the tank. If you have both of those things, uh, then it's probably going to be that third scenario as to why it didn't light. So just go ahead and flip that switch off, flip it back on. It's going to recycle another three times. Generally, as long as you've corrected the issue, uh, it will light by the uh, end of the third time or by the first try of the second cycle. Um, beside that, we have your interior lights. Uh, this is going to control most of the overhead lights within the unit. Uh, you have some stragglers like the one here in the kitchen, the under cabinet lighting, things like that, that are going to uh, have to be turned off independently. Uh, we have your porch light here. That's that amber colored light we saw there on the outside. We have your uh, awning lights. Uh, now there is an LED light strip on that awning um, that will help uh, light that space in the event that you are kind of hanging out there on the porch after dark. 
uh, slide room in and out switch. Uh, only kind of word of warning with that uh, is this is a Schwintec system. I referenced that earlier in the presentation. It's very important that we, uh, when operating that slide, that we come fully in or go fully out. Uh, no short bursts, no partial openings, things like that. It's either all the way out or all the way in. Uh, reason being is you have two independently geared motors that are pushing that slide in and out. If you tend to use short burst or partial openings, uh, what can happen is that slide can kind of jump a tooth rotate in its position and then it's going to be in a bind and not come either in or out so uh, again fully in fully out uh, on that slide out room switch uh, awning uh, that is a momentary switch as well you can partially open that you don't need to fully open it uh, you can operate that as you would like um, kind of chase that sun in the sky only warning with that is of course these awnings are very expensive uh, they are lightweight by design. You're only going to want to use that awning on a nice, clear, sunny day. Uh, not something that you would ever want to leave your campsite with that awning out unattended. Uh, so just a few things to think about with that. Uh, down low here, uh, we have your stereo system, multimedia center. Uh, this is going to give you, uh, of course, you have some, some auxiliary uh, or inputs into the unit. Uh, you have Bluetooth connectability, and you also have AM, FM radio. Uh, you have two zones of speakers, one for the inside, and two is going to be for the outside. You're going to control the volume uh, of each zone separately. Very basic, again, basic head unit, very easy to navigate. Uh, if you do have any questions on how to do so, please consult the manual or give us a call. We'd be happy to walk you through that. Uh, down below that, uh, again, one of my favorite, favorite appliances uh, that they're sticking in these is going to be this little Greystone uh, fireplace. Now, uh, tons of options in, in controlling it. Uh, you know, of course, you have your on off power switch, um, you know, but you also can have full control over like the colors of the flames. Uh, you can change, you know, again, you can really tons of different options in terms of color, which is just very, very cool. Uh, and it is also a heater as well. So it's kind of like a, a built-in space heater. Uh, you can, you know, follow that dis the button display there uh, to set some, some predetermined temperatures. Uh, it does also have a built-in thermostat, so you can set a, a thermostat and a timer uh, and allow that to come on and off uh, during use. But it is a very, very cool feature. Um, you know, uh, I would see myself personally getting a lot of use out of that. Uh, down low here, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, we have your replaceable automotive blade style fuses here on the right. Uh, my recommendation is going to be pick up in a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. Uh, make sure you have a spare in the event that you uh, lose functionality to one going down the road. Uh, we have your uh, resettable 110 volt breakers there on the left side. Uh, just like your fuse panel, at at fuse panel box at home, you may go ahead and have to reset those from time to time. Uh, in terms of function, they are marked here on the door. So, uh, hopping over here, uh, up top, we have your smoke alarm. Uh, second piece of safety equipment that we've come to, uh, standard nine volt smoke alarm, just like you're probably used to at home. Uh, and again, we're going to want to test that every single time we take the unit out. So it has a test tab. Make sure you uh, push that. Make sure you have an audible sound. Keep a spare 9-volt battery with the unit. Uh, it's not something you want to uh, deal with, that chirping noise uh, in the middle of the night when you are camping. Uh, Pre-wired for solar. Uh, what that means is this would be the mounting location for your charge controller. Uh, in the event that you choose to add some rooftop panels. So all the hard work, again, is done for you. Uh, would be very easy to make that upgrade in the future. Uh, we have your uh, thermostat here, a Dometic uh, Captive Touch thermostat. Uh, we have the mode button here on the left, temperature control here on the right. So when I hit that mode button, uh, my first selection is going to be fan speed, and I have to confirm a fan speed before I can move on. Uh, your cho choices are low, high, and auto. So if I go to either low or high fan speed, that's a set fan speed, and that means that that fan's gonna run indefinitely whether or not it's uh, hit that set temperature or not. Uh, that means high or low fan, whether I, my next step is ultimately gonna be furnace. So uh, 
to keep it kind of right with you, uh, you know, kind of a more personalized touch uh, is going to be in that auto side of things. So once I confirm that fan speed, I go ahead. My first uh, selection is going to be air conditioner noted by the snowflake there. You can hear that air conditioner kick on. Uh, we have that temperature set here up or down. Uh, now, if I go one further, that's going to kick me into furnace mode. Uh, once it kind of catches up, it's going to power down that air conditioner. It's going to kick on that blower motor immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, within that first 15 minutes of operation, it may or may not set off this smoke alarm. Uh, per manufacturer's recommendations, that is totally acceptable. It, the, the, uh, as the uh, appliance runs or continues to run, that efficiency rating goes way up. Uh, so if that happens within the first 15 minutes of operation, nothing that you need to be concerned about. So just kind of keep that in mind. And then we go ahead and turn that off. Everything's going to go ahead and power down for us. Uh, another GFCI protected outlet here. Uh, and then down low, we have your uh, third piece of safety equipment, which is going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. That is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper, so no batteries to change or anything like that does have a test button on it, functions very much like a smoke alarm, it is going to indicate you, to you uh, which one of those gases it is sensing. Uh, of course, if it is going off uh, continuously, uh, making sure that we're going to vent the, the area uh, and evacuate the area as well. Uh, pocket doors here, uh, separating the bathroom, not only from the bedroom, but from the kitchen area as well, uh, strapped in there. Uh, so they're not flopping going down the road. And then you have magnetic closes here. So uh, very nice, solid close there. Uh, and it is nice to have that kind of store out of the way, especially in an area so small. Uh, to not have that swinging door uh, is going to be very beneficial. Uh, coming here into the restroom, uh, on the left side here, we have your shower. Uh, this is a magnetic shower curtain there. So you have a magnetic strip that's going to keep that uh, closed when uh, using it. Uh, on the shower head, we have an on off switch. Uh, we're going to use that to conserve hot water uh, or overall water consumption. Uh, most of our customers find themselves taking uh, military or Navy style showers, cutting that water on and off during that shower to again conserve their water consumption. Uh, toilet has a pedal flush. It'll be a light press to fill up the bowl, full press to flush. Very easy to do. Um, now, it's very important that we use a single ply RV grade toilet paper here. Uh, that way it has a better chance of dissolving within the tank. And it's very important that we use not only a deodorizing chemical treatment, but also a tissue dissolver. Uh, both of those products are going to be introduced right here in the, uh, from the toilet. Of course, you're going to introduce those before using the unit. Also, it's going to be my recommendation that you put a toilet treatment in the black water tank uh, before storing the unit that way. Uh, when it's sitting there baking in the sun, it's not getting extra stinky uh, just sitting there. Uh, over here on this side, of course, nothing too crazy. On off switch for the lights. Now, I've referenced the GFCI uh, protected receptacles throughout the unit. This is the actual GFCI outlet. That is the resettable one. Uh, all these receptacles are on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, uh, they all follow suit. That's going to be the reset point to restore functionality uh, to the unit itself. Uh, pro tip, if that refrigerator is not working here on the outside, uh, this is going to be your culprit here. So make sure that that has not been tripped. Uh, also here uh, in the restroom, we have your road vac. Uh, this is a really, really cool feature that I'm, I'm glad they started uh, utilizing here in these R-Pods. Um, you of course have an on off switch here that's going to turn on the hose port. Uh, that would be an extra add-on, the connection hose that would allow you to go actually go around the unit and, and sweep stuff up. Uh, but you also have this drawer here. Uh, I'm not going to lift it up because it is very, very kind of obnoxiously loud here on the microphone. Uh, but what the idea being is that you, you get a, an old-fashioned broom, uh, you sweep a nice big pile up to the unit, you go ahead and open that door, uh, just going to draw it right in. Now there is a a uh, bag for this unit, just like any other vacuum that would need to be replaced. Uh, to do so, you're going to stick your thumb here in that hole. That's going to remove that faceplate there, and then we can see your bag uh, right there.
So above my head here, we have uh, an exhaust fan. Uh, now this does have a lock position, so make sure that we are pulling that knob down to unlock it. Uh, once we've done so, we're going to uh, rotate that counterclockwise to open it. And once open, we can go ahead and turn uh, the fan on and off. We have uh, four fan speeds. And that really will get up and move. Uh, that's going to be designed to suck all the moisture from the air uh, if you're taking a shower or just to kind of uh, circulate air, uh, keep it from getting so stagnant here uh, in the, the space. Uh, we turn it off. It is very, very, very important that we do close this before going down the road. Uh, I often make the joke that it's something you only forget once because it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going. So once we've closed that, uh, you don't have to go crazy uh, with, with bearing down on this. Uh, but once we are satisfied with it being closed, we go ahead and push up. Uh, that's going to go ahead and lock it for travel. Uh, coming here into the uh, bedroom, uh, starting here on the far side, uh, of course, we have this toggle switch that's going to turn the backlighting off uh, within the cabinets. Uh, we also have storage underneath the bed, which is a very efficient use of space. Uh, we have 110 volt uh, outlets here on this side of the bed, as well as USB chargers. And on this side of the bed, um, we have the same. So uh, dual 110 volt outlets on each side of the bed, dual uh, 12 volt USBs. Uh, now, here in the bedroom windows, we have two different style of windows going on. Uh, of course, emergency exit here. Uh, in the event uh, that the entry door is blocked for your exit, uh, if you're particularly motivated enough, you can go ahead and, and open up these uh, levers here. That full window pane and all is going to swing out full like a doggy door. So you can uh, exit the unit from that location. Uh, now, other than that, this becomes just a standard window like the others. And all of the units are all of the windows within this unit operate the very same way. They have a locking tab here that is spring loaded. So if we lift that up, that allows us to go ahead and open the window. Uh, that's going to be the very same for every single window. When we close it, we want to make sure that that snaps down and is in fact locked closed. Uh, the shades on all of the windows are again going to be the very same. Uh, they utilize that friction style shade It is just a pull down from the top. Now, one thing I didn't point out throughout the camper is, of course, we saw that, um, that main uh, overhead light switch. Now, these are all, uh, you can operate these independently as well of that switch. They all have a push button there on the center lens. Uh, you can go ahead and push that button. That's going to go ahead and turn those on. Uh, now, switching gears over here to the uh, other side, uh, we have this large blank space for a secondary TV. Uh, feel free to go ahead and install a TV back here. Uh, but most importantly, this unit is equipped with an omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. Uh, now that antenna feeds both of these TV locations. What that means for you is that for that to be in effect or to, to work properly, this red light needs to be on. So you're going to turn it on back here, even if you are trying to utilize that antenna. Uh, for the the front TV. So uh, if you're utilizing that part cable service that we've referenced uh, at the very beginning of this presentation, that red light needs to be on. They share that same pathway, or excuse me, that red light would need to be off. They share that same pathway uh, to allow that cable signal to bleed through. That antenna booster does have to be off. So keep that in mind. Um, other than that, uh, just mount your TV center here. Uh, the backing plate is going to be center of this location. So uh, I do believe that just about covers it here on the interior of the RPOD 202. Uh, if I've missed something uh, or if you have any questions, if there's something that we can explain further, we'd be more than happy to do so. Just give us a call. Uh, we can walk you through or answer any questions over the phone. I hope you enjoyed the walkthrough. Thank you very much.